Hello, my brothers and sisters in Christ. I don't know about you, but I can feel something's different. I can feel all the love, and I hope you guys can feel uplifted by the presence of his love because the, this is the day that the Lord has made. We are in the very last days. The very, very last days are upon us. Um, and these Song of Solomon's, videos these are to lift your heart let it lift you up let it lift you up and out okay let's get straight into it song of solomon's chapter 2 verse 1 i am the rose of sharon and the lily of the valleys i am the rose of sharon sharon is an open plain the barren wilderness he is the rose within the barren wilderness as a rose he is a token of love and he has a fragrant savor However, a rose also has thorns, and upon their stems, their backbones or their spines, and when the fragrance of love is rejected, the rejection both pierces the Lord, his side, um, but, it also pierce, but it also pierces the rejectee with revealing their thorns of unkindness and unlovingness and um, ungodliness, right? And... And their lack of love is shown to them. So this is talking about the rose being the double-edged sword. The Lord declares to woman, he is a lily also. He is also the gentle and delicate love that shimmers above the waters among the lilies of darkness. Now, remember also that the Lord was the crown of had the crown of thorns put on his head. Songs 2.2. 2. As a lily... Among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. As a lily among thorns, he's now is now calling those that cut off from his love the thorns. And he's saying that he is as a lily, you know, uh, fragile and delicate flower. He's as a lily among these thorns and brambles. Notice the connection to the crown of thorns and the thorns being placed on his head. So is my love among the daughters. He has hidden his lily himself, the delicate love, the, the gentle love, the, the endless abundant love in the hearts of his lilies. And it's himself, okay? And they're in the hearts of his chosen daughters, chosen vessels, chosen arcs. We also notice here that the language is changing from singular, like I warned you about in chapter one, it goes from a singular woman to more than one woman, okay? So there's the, the one daughter and then there's the daughters, there's the, the one woman and then there's the other women, okay? We also notice here that the lang um sorry, I just said that. Okay. This is because although wisdom, even woman, is the first fruit of the female arcs, because Christ was the first fruit of the male, right? So the woman is the first fruit of the female, okay? So even though she's the first fruit of the ark, there's more to follow. And so from here we will see that he speaks between her, the one chosen, and also her consorts, his other daughters. In Psalms 2.3 it says, As an apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among, among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. This is so powerful. Now wisdom woman is beginning to understand that she has a physical atom under the apple tree. What? He's a fallen male. He was brought up under the apple tree, the fallen tree, right? And, and you know, I've heard all these arguments that it wasn't an apple. Forget it. Forget talking logically to me because it's not gonna, it's it, it's not gonna get you anywhere. All right? When the Lord uses this symbolic language, it is because they are like little pieces of a puzzle that need to be placed back together again. So there's no accident that it's an apple tree. The apple tree is what the world has used as, as the fruit that fell, okay? So when it says he's born under the apple tree, he's born, he was born, these men were born, some of the women, but symbolically, this is just telling us, the, the husband that I'm going to give you in the flesh has been brought up through corrupt flesh, okay? But I'm going to change that corrupt flesh. This is a fallen male. Trees of wood are pillars, so... She now understands that her husband will manifest in a physical son. The Lord will come to her in flesh incorruptible as a manifest son of God. And she submits to this promise and sits under his shadow. She knows she is hidden from him, this husband. She is in his shadow, not his forethought.
For until he makes his forethought, oh, sorry, for until the male's forethought is overwritten by the father's forethought, the father's will, he just cannot have his ark. He's not allowed. There's a failsafe. He can't unlock it, right? But this spiritual portion of which she now understands is the same spirit as her and that they've both stem from this same spirit and that spirit portion is Christ Jesus and it is the sweetest love she's ever known. But she doesn't even know who he is in the flesh. But she feels all this love. Psalm 2.4 He brought me into the banqueting house and his banner over me was love. The spirit they share, this husband and wife in Christ, is becoming one with her. She's becoming one with the spirit portion. And the Lord takes her into the banquet house and feeds her with love and faith and hope and truth. And the banner over her was love. The Lord is love. Also the banner is the rainbow. Songs 2.5 Stay me with flagons and comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. Flagons means something that presses together, like two rollers on a printing press. She is calling for the Lord to bring them, her and her husband, back into the oneness and love and pressing them back together on earth the way that you are. Uh, she's saying press us back together the way on earth, the way that you are revealing to me we already are in spirit. We're pressed together. We're one. To be comforted by the fruit of the womb. I'm sick of love means I'm tired and afflicted and worn. Okay, you can go look all this up in, in your Strong's Concordance if you like because, you know, some, I'm not going to keep doing these essay things with each word, but it's in there, okay? She's saying, I'm, I'm sick of love, means I'm tired and afflicted and worn. For the more she is discovering love in spirit, she is realizing the love of the world does not compare. Her longing for a true love is increasing, but also the pain, and, pain of the absence of that love that love's physical manifestation is causing her grief and despair. Songs 2.6 His left hand is under my head and his right hand doth embrace me. But the Lord comforts her in the spirit while she's feeling this longing. Okay, his left hand under her head, that's, his, that's her, him in his mind. You know, sorry, him in her mind. The right hand that embraces her, it's embracing her heart. He's keeping her safe. He's keeping her loved and protected and filling her even though she's feeling all of this discomfort because it's not happening in the real world. Oh, sorry. He is the real world. This world. The world we think is the real world. Sons 2.7 I charge ye, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, that ye stir not up nor awake my love till he please. Now she gives a command to the daughters, do not stir up my husband's love. She is now afraid and her physical, she's afraid that her physical Adam will become caught up in the love of another woman. And she is saying he is mine and he is reserved for me, leave him alone. Yet she's still not sure who he is, but she knows him in spirit. Till he please, until the appointed time of his awakening to true love. Now I want you to understand that this doesn't mean these males lack a knowledge or, oh, sorry, I don't know why I'm tripping so badly. This doesn't mean that these males lack a knowledge of and a relationship in Christ. It just means that they are not yet awakened to become one in the knowledge of spiritual marriage, for that has an appointed time. Sons 2.8 The voice of my beloved, behold, he cometh leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. This is the voice of the Lord and her spirit portion. When it speaks to her, it leaps as it sends to her body the reverberations of sound and light. It raises her vibration and frequency and raises her cells in the inner body, but it also sends shockwaves of love through the planet. Yes, I am serious. I am not kidding. This is how we all together raise the planet and bring heaven to earth. It is through love. Songs 2.9 My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. A roe equals splendor, beautiful, glorious. A heart is a male deer. So I want you to imagine that the deer is leaping through the forest. Okay? You know, go watch Bambi. Alright? He standeth behind our wall. So she sees him in the spirit, hidden from, out the, from the outer wall. She shows him through the lattice. The lattice is the reference to the fact that she has her flesh vision obscured. Like I said in chapter 1, there is a process of superimposition. For woman wisdom, men that are not her husband, who are lusting after another man's wife, are pushing their own forethought outside God's will upon her with their thoughts. It doesn't even matter if they don't tell her they are thinking these thoughts. 
their thought forms jump in their mind sorry their thought forms jump in her mind and confuse her ability to identify her atom every thought is like a signal on a radio wave okay this is this is why our world is so jumbled up because all of these uh, self-willed thought forms are going out there and confusing people okay now the men who do take advantage of her physically and oppose their self-will by taking her or tricking her or attempting to seduce her or attempting to take her physically their super impositions are even stronger and she can and does and I testify to this become temporarily made to believe they are he her husband and some men actually try to convince her that it is them okay but the scent of her true husband is so strong and powerful in Christ Jesus that these super impositions do not last some last a day, some last a year, and some last 10 years. I use that because my longest relationship was 10 years. But as each woman grows in Christ Jesus as a woman mother wisdom portion, these super impositions begin to fall away quicker and quicker until there are no fake counterfeits left standing in the way. Songs 2.10 My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. While this process of super imposition, or to be more specific, the pulling off, of these masks of superimposition and these masks of counterfeit males the Lord is still guiding her through and encourages her to lift up out of each superimposition which are likened to dimensional steps of a ladder Jacob's ladder overcoming each one raises her higher and higher hence he the Lord says rise up my fair one and come away let it go step up here come hither right songs 211 for lo the winter is past and the rain is over and gone the winter is past as a reference to her no longer being starved of love. She has love abundantly already and does not need to limit herself to these counterfeit versions of it. The rain is over and gone. Her sorrow is past. He's saying, come here, up here. It looks gorgeous. Up here, it's beautiful. Just come. The lag is ours. The lag is the woman's. The forethought of the father is, the, is his will. The woman who is fallen in physical flesh, she has a time lag okay once she catches up with the four thoughts will there is no time lag anymore okay so she so basically the reality and the and the 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 manifestation already exists on another dimensional level and a lot of christians hate this talk because they think it's new age or they think it's scientific you know what the bible is quantum physics okay it is quantum physics and i will die defending that because it is the truth and i know him i know the lord okay the reality has already been established this is why all through the bible all through sorry the new testament he says it is done it is finished it is done it is finished the reality that we're trying to get to already exists we just have to keep stepping up and out okay the winter is past as a reference to her longer um, no longer being starved of love okay then we go to 212 where he says the flowers appear on the earth and the time of singing of birds is come and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land now some bibles um some audios have the where the woman speaks and the man speaks mixed up okay um this is him speaking still these are two these are the things he's saying to her he says he's telling her there is a reality here now if only you will step up into it you do not need to suffer this way it is here now come and see come and look 213 the fig tree put forth her green figs and the vines with tender grapes give a good smell arise my love my fair one and come away he's saying up here my beloved you are abundantly giving forth good good fruit up here just come and you will see it you will see what's really going on you can't see because of your own perspective but if you come up and look at it from my perspective you will see how amazing what we are doing is right 214 oh my dove that art in the clefts of the rocks and the secret places of the stairs let me see thy countenance let me hear thy voice for sweet is thy voice and thy countenance is comely she's responding to him now she is comforted by his presence and his promise and she asks let me see you please let me see you manifest in my atom let me hear your physical voice for it is sweet in the inner world in the inner in the spirit but i can only imagine how sweet it is in the outer she also says your countenance is comely inviting she knows now that if she, if if in the spirit she feels so in love 
then when this Adam arrives and speaks her name, she's going to melt. And his countenance, not his looks, his countenance, his spiritual portion and anointing will be everything she loves and adores. 2.15. He's speaking back to her again. He's saying, right, okay, now listen, take up the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. Now the Lord speaks again, interjecting and says, take up the foxes. Let us remove these impositions. Let us move these idiots out of the way who do not know what they do. They are spoiling my vines, plural. They are fragile and tender fruit. He's talking about destroying the other daughters of Zion, the younger daughters, the siblings of this first one. Notice he's actually giving her a command. He's saying to her, <coughs> you and me, woman, you and me, we're going to remove these men. And the damage that they are doing, you and me are going to make this process easier for the other daughters of Zion, the other women, by removing these superimpositions so the other daughters have an easier path. And she says back to him, My beloved is mine, and I am his, and he feedeth among the lilies. She is so assured in his love that she has no jealousy to his promise to his other lilies. His other arcs of wisdom, she is so secure. And she knows that the Lord enjoys the beauty of every other daughter of Zion just the same. But her role is different and she has a responsibility. And then in 2.17, until the day break and the shadows flee away, turn, my beloved, and be thou like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of Betha. She's talking, she's telling the Lord, go to the other women. So he said to her, we have to do this. She says, okay, then you can go. I'll let you go. I'm not going to keep you just to myself, right? I'm not going to expect that. Not that she ever could, but it's just, you know, she's saying, I understand. We need to do this. Our love can help that. You can go, right? Until the day of the Lord, until the day breaks, and the shadows, the demons, the superimpositions of the self will once flee away. Until then, until that happens, go, my husband. Until then, and you leap and you turn your focus from me and turn to these other daughters and leap in their hearts too. She knows how to share love, for it has no beginning and no end, for God is love. This is perfect love. I love you, brothers and sisters. I'll be back. <laughs>